uh, Laura, when we're talking about all the data in hand, keeping those side effects in mind, coming back to that patient in front of you, do we have any data that ribocyclob is our preferred option in almost all our subsets? Premenopausal, postmenopausal, lobular, ductal. Do we have yeah. any hint of how it's working throughout? Yeah, so we've seen the subset analyses of these trials that really does show that it works across the board here. I think sometimes a patient will say, you know, is there something special for lobular? And I think reassuring them that we have the subset analyses from these trials that does show that the benefit is there um, across these different populations. Um, so I think just reassuring patients. I think the only subset where, again, I'm not using ribocyclib in the first line is that Inova 120 population where we now have that option as well. But, you know, barring other comorbidities, there's not any particular details of their disease that would kind of make me shy away necessarily. One thing to just mention, because it's come up a lot in these discussions, is that we don't really know who gets the liver toxicity is not so frequent. But when it happens, it can be scary because the enzymes can be quite high. It, I do believe that the uh, steatohepatitis now called, uh, I don't know, metabolic associated liver or something, this fun that anyway, can't say it. But, but it's all naffled. Metabolic acid. Oh, yeah, metabolic. And the, um, so that actually, I saw a patient who got ribo who had clear, you know, steatic hepatitis, and that was not a good choice. I think we would probably avoid ribo in patients of underlying liver dysfunction because it's so difficult to evaluate. Our patients are generally pretty healthy, so that's rare. But you do want to pay attention to that. And Hope, you brought up the point where if one does experience liver toxicity, utilization of steroids does rever revert that function itself. So that's vital. And again, like we're talking about this in terms of incidence, we're talking about 15 to 20 percent of that uptrend of LFTs, which is, again, all great. Not every single person that we're seeing ends up being with grade three. But it's important for us to recognize that it's about 15 to 20 percent that will likely run into the coma. Hot off the press, we're seeing oral third make their way here. Yeah. <laughs> Going back to a completely disease site in early settings. Are we off the hook with CDK4-6 inhibitors in that high-risk patient? Or you're going to let the sequence these experiments when we have the data, five-year data of disease-free survival? Yeah, no, I think the very first thing is very exciting. Absolutely. Right? Uh, decades of trying to bring these oral thirds in various settings. And we now, after 25 years, are talking about a newer endocrine option in the early state setting. So yay, uh, it's very, very exciting. I think it was very interesting to see the hazard ratios. Very impressive that despite 70% being a high-risk patient population, a good amount of patients with high-risk disease that were included, uh, despite the broader criteria of stage one to three, uh, the hazard ratios are similar to what we had seen at the first readout, say for the ATAC trial or for the monarchy at the two-year IDFS or the Natalie at the three-year IDFS. So that part was very impressive. Having said that, I think the medium risk patients that are also included, they are not necessarily the ones that are contributing all the events. These are the high risk patients that they are. It's an early readout in terms of analysis. It's very impressive. It's great. And yes, we've definitely shown superiority to current standard of care endocrine therapy. I do think that we do have more mature data right now with CDK4-6 inhibitors, including at ESMO when we saw Monarch E and the overall survival benefit. And Given that we have all of these data, it does make me feel like maybe we need a little bit more follow-up, one to see how this checks out. And I, I feel like I believe that it would continue to, um, but it'll be good to have that data. And two, I think we don't necessarily have to really wonder what would happen if there was a CDK4-6 inhibitor. We know that we can right. combine them with a CDK4-6 inhibitor, but there are randomized trials that are currently ongoing asking that question. And so we will have data from those randomized studies as well. The current genodestrin study will also have a sub-study with a combination of abemaciclib, and that will provide us some non-randomized safety data for the early stage patients as well. Okay. And the one way I think about this is also that, you know, we, we worry about early recurrences with ER positive disease, and we worry about late recurrences with ER positive disease. And for the early recurrence patients with high-risk disease, I think having a CDK4-6 inhibitor seems really, really appropriate. That's where they're going to act potentially. Maybe for the late relapses, the SWIT studies might be very, very helpful too. And we have ongoing SIRT trials with thousands and thousands of patients as well that are addressing that question with upfront treatment, which would allow a CDK, and then a SWIT strategy. And so I think we hopefully can have all these definitive randomized data sets as well. But 
The good news is we're seeing a very good readout yep. and there's more to come and unfold to understand what is the best optimal strategy. Can we use all of these strategies? Time will tell. Yeah, you know, these are exciting times, but right this minute, the standard of care in early settings for that right patient is still CDK4-6 inhibitors with endocrine therapy. In metastatic settings, again, that frontline CDK4-6 inhibitor with RIBO having the strongest data with endocrine therapy still remains our current standard of care. Before we close, Heather, any final thoughts here in metastatic settings with CDK4-6 inhibitors? Well, I think it's just a very exciting time to be in a very hopeful time to be treating breast cancer for both providers and um, patients. We've had an unprecedented number of FDA approvals of positive data sets in the last few years. And so to have all of these new options is really terrific. I was going back to the post-monarch data. I, I, I did find that a little sobering because I think we were patting ourselves on the back with all the first line data and the benefits in the second line were more modest than we would have hoped. So there's still a lot of work to do, but very exciting to see so many very promising drugs. Oh, anything to add here? I think um, postmark was a little bit on the less benefit than we would have liked. But then we saw the data with oral SIRDs, both uh, imlunesterant and abemaciclib, although the comparator, the right comparator isn't there, a little complicated, but we'll see an update at San Antonio from uh, Como uh, soon. And, uh, but also we have the Avera trial where we see some biomarker updates here. And uh, there we also had an oral surge with a targeted agent in both arms. And I think what I'm sort of taking from that, and now with Ladera too, is that, you know, there may be situations where these drugs are better even if you don't have an ESR1 mutation. The response was better with Gerogestrant and Everolimus than with Fulvestrant or uh, Eximestane and Everolimus. So, you know, we don't know. These are smaller trials. So I think we're going to learn a lot from the early stage setting. But I do think oral surgery are going to have an increasing place in our treatment paradigm in both metastatic and early stage disease. You know, this feels moving fast, coming back to the current standard of care for my community colleagues, be it for that high tumor burden or that metastatic disease for the right patient. CD get four, six inhibitors with endocrine therapy today are still the standard of care. Heather, Laura, Hope, Como, thank you so much for joining us and walking us through this rapidly evolving field. Absolutely. Well, thanks.